Good morning and welcome. I'm Josefa Salinas, your host. So many topics are on the tip of everyone's tongue and one that should never go away, that should be with us always until there are some final resolutions to this, are the topics of immigration, the children and parents who are separated at the border, who are placed in inhuman conditions. Um, It amazes me that we aren't marching in the streets about that, that we aren't carrying signs, more of us, all over the place. That the just the lack of humanity that we have seen, and is it because we haven't seen enough of it? I mean, what is it? What is it going to take for us to realize that there uh, decisions have to be made? We've had some great ones by the Supreme Court recently, but some final decisions need to be made with regard to immigration. And there's a book that is going to tell a story that you are going to want to hear, the Book of Rosie, a mother's story of separation at the border. One of the authors, or the person who co-authored it with the person who is the subject, is with us this morning. Julie Coyasso is with us. Good morning, Julie. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. Thank you. It's so good to have you here. And, you know, you have an interesting background, Julie, in that you were a social worker and an art therapist, creative arts therapist, prior to getting involved with the um, idea and the struggle of immigration. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background and then what led you to putting immigrant families together, that organization together? Sure. So I am a former social worker. I left the field about 15 years ago because I was really frustrated by the ways in which the bureaucracy of nonprofits really prevent people who are drawn to that field to do the work that they are called to do and that would be most effective for the people that they serve. Um, Pretty quickly after I came out of social work school with my master's degree, I became the assistant director of an agency here in New York City, and saw firsthand just how difficult it is to actually make change. And I just became very disillusioned by that. And so I left the field and became a writer and journalist. And I moved to Puerto Rico and then to Mexico with my husband, who is a Cuban refugee. And um, primarily, I was writing about Latin America. And um, when we came back to New York, I um, had three kids with him, and so by the time family separation was happening in the summer of 2018, um, I had a very successful career as an editor and a translator, and um, but felt very strongly that we needed to be doing something um, helpful in response to the zero separation, um, zero tolerance family separation policy, and. Um, I heard an attorney on the radio here in New York talking about his client who had been separated from her children, and he said, look, she can proceed with her immigration case from anywhere in the country. She doesn't need to be in immigration detention. She just needs to be able to pay her bond and be reunited with her kids. And I thought, well, that sounds fairly straightforward enough. I think I have enough angry friends to be able to raise money for this person's bond and we'll figure out a way to get her from Arizona to New York and back with her kids. I did not intend for this to become an organization or a movement, but because there was such a profound outpouring and response, um, the money didn't stop coming in. The offers to help and support and volunteer didn't stop coming in. And um, it just kept continuing. So Rosie is the sixth mother for whom we posted bonds, but to date we've posted more than $1 million worth of bonds um, for 120 parents, grandparents, and older siblings who were separated from children at the border. So let's talk a little bit about how that process actually happens, because I, I really don't think that enough people are aware of how this happens. So let's talk about, like, let's just talk about Rosie's journey. She came from, is it Guatemala? Sure. Guatemala, I believe, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. What made her decide that she wanted to make that trip north? So Rosie grew up during Guatemala's Civil War. So her entire childhood was really steeped in violence. Um, and that violence was both physical violence and, and loss, but also the economic violence that comes through physical violence. Um, so by the time she was a young adult, she had already just experienced a lot of hardship. Um, but she got married. The Her husband, who was the father of um, three of her children, was killed. Um, shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, she was shot twice, um, at which point she really thought, this is not a safe place for me to be, and I'm raising children. Her oldest son was approaching his teenage years, which is a time that's particularly vulnerable for boys 
in Central America, um, as they often get pressured to be um, joining gangs, and she didn't want that kind of future for him. So she decided to set off on a journey to the States with her two sons. She also has two daughters, um, and she decided to leave her daughters with her sister and her mother um, until she could bring them here safely after establishing asylum here herself. And she's actually in that process right now. Um, but it was a difficult and dangerous journey. And of course, when she got to the United States, she was then separated from her sons um, who were sent to a foster care facility in New York City. And she remained in this detention center in Arizona for 81 days. Now, that has to be just heart wrenching for a parent. I can't even begin to imagine. There's nothing inside of me that allows me to imagine me getting off a plane or coming across a border or getting out of my car and somebody coming and taking my children from me. I, I think I yeah, probably I think, would have been a fight. Yeah, I, I think what's particularly difficult is, you know, I mean, it's it's terrible under every circumstance, right? But I think when you have no opportunity to prepare your children, you know, kids need to know um, beginnings and endings. They need to know what to expect next. And, you know, one of the things that I asked her about her journey here, I said, Rosie, how do you keep her, her youngest son was five, how do you keep a five-year-old going, right? Like, I have a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and a 10-year-old. We went on a 90-minute car trip yesterday, and every two minutes, are we there yet? <laughs> are we there yet? Right. I'm hungry. <laughs> I have to pee. You know, and so I said to her, like, how in the world do you travel with a five-year-old child for five days in the back of a truck? and keep them quiet and and not be able to feed them and she said you have to tell a lot of lies right like you have to say isn't this a fun trip um yes we're going to be there soon yes we're going to eat soon you don't know if you're going to eat soon you don't know when you're going to get there but you have to keep them engaged and hopeful in order to keep them alive and so what is really heartbreaking i think is when she gets to the united states and guards tell her that they're taking her sons to the shower and then they're sending them somewhere and she doesn't even know where they're going. You know, her youngest son says to her, well, aren't you coming with us? And she says, well, they're just going to take you for a drive. There's not enough room for me in the car. I'll come later. And she has no clue what's happening, but she has to tell these stories to keep him hopeful and not to keep him even more terrified than he already is. Um, and I think, it requires a kind of parental resourcefulness that is difficult for anybody to muster. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I, there's nothing in me that allows me to even imagine that. Um, I, the yeah. horror, being a parent, the, the horror of having your child taken from you and you have no idea where they're going in a country that you're not familiar with and you have no idea what's going to happen to them, what's going to be done to them. But let's talk a little bit about her journey once she gets to detention. What kind of a facility was she put in and what did she experience? Well, we call these detention centers, but they're prisons. Um, she's issued a prison prison uniform, um, lives according to a prison schedule, is in a cell with a cellmate on a metal bunk bed with a really thin mattress. Um, you know, toiletries are rationed, feminine hygiene products are rationed. When people have medical complaints, they're told to take an ibuprofen and drink more water. Um, it's a really rigid, um, painful, abusive setting. Um, and, you know, the women are not allowed, for example, to even touch each other. They're not allowed to braid each other's hair. They're not able to hug one another. Um, so it's a really, it's an environment where there's a lot of forced um, separation of all types, right? And, and not a lot of information that helps them navigate this process. Nobody is there to advocate for them and help them. Um, and so the fact that anybody sort of got a lifeline out of there is pretty remarkable. Isn't that a form of torture, telling someone that you, you can't touch yes. someone? I mean, I think there's plenty of scientific proven evidence. Anybody could look that up on the Internet right now and find out that if you deprive someone of human contact, of human touch, of um, human interaction, that is a form of mental abuse. Yeah. I mean, the the levels of psychological and emotional abuse to which these parents have been exposed is really, I think, inconceivable. And I think if we heard about this happening in any other country, we would be um, rallying outcries about human rights abuses, right? But this is happening right in our own backyard under our own watch. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I want people to just think for a minute. If you went on a trip, uh, let's say you went to Canada or you went to Mexico or you went to the Bahamas or Jamaica or um, the Caribbean, and when you got off the plane, all of a sudden your children were taken from you and you were thrown in a situation like this, you would expect the government to rally behind you. You would never tolerate this, and yet we're right. tolerating it. In, I mean, even just beyond what we're talking about, I mean, I've seen just horrifying photos of children in cages like dogs, like it's a kennel. Yep. And this is America. Yeah, when Rosie's kids were separated. When Rosie's kids were separated from her and they were put in these gray jumpsuits and um, put on a plane to New York, um, Fernando's, they gave him a pair of flip-flops that didn't fit, so he went without any shoes at all. I mean, can you imagine? Like, you've been ripped away from your mother. You are not allowed to bring any of your, you know, like your security blanket or anything with you. You have no clue where you're going. You have no clue when you'll see your mother again, and you don't even have a pair of shoes on your feet. Boy, I tell you, it's it's so startling to me that we're having a discussion. We think that we're talking about some country somewhere, but we're talking about the United States of America. And right. it's just, it is so disheartening to think that these things are going on here and that more people aren't outraged. Why do you think more people aren't outraged? Is it because we haven't seen enough? We haven't actually seen film footage of children being ripped out of their parents' arms. We haven't seen film footage of these kids being put in jumpsuits like prisoners and then marched off barefoot to God knows where. Well, I think it's a few things, right? I think our attention is really divided. I think there's a lot to be outraged by in this country. (laughs) And so... I think often people don't see, and one of the things that Rosie and I very much hope that they will begin to see through her book is that all of these issues are related, right? All of these different mechanisms of oppression are related. And so we have to pay attention to all of them. Rosie believes, and I do too, it's possible to hold space and to make space for responding to all of these oppressions, to all of these abuses. I think you're right. You know, we're not necessarily great at responding to what we can't see with our own eyes, which is another reason why I think her book is so important. I also think one of the things that I've seen as the director of Immigrant Families Together, which has been both overwhelming in a positive way and also in a way a little bit terrifying is how many people come to me and they say, just tell me what to do. There are so many people who do want to respond. They do want to react. They do want to stand up against us, and they don't know specifically what to do. They're waiting for somebody to tell them, and that worries me. You know, I I think, are we so far away from the notion of what it means to be a democracy, which means your active engagement as an individual citizen, right? Like I keep saying to people, nobody's coming to fix the situation, whatever the situation is. Nobody's coming to save us. We are the ones who have to do the work, right? So I think what's so powerful about what we have done as an organization is we are all still volunteers two years later. Everybody who's done this, nobody had any specific skill set or, you know, resources or contacts to sort of intervene and make something happen. And maybe it was on a small scale. Maybe we only posted bonds. As somebody at a speech I once gave, somebody in the back of the room said, you only posted bond for, at that moment, it was 54 people. It's only 54 people. And it's like, yeah, but for each of those 54 people, it mattered. You know, and I think when, as citizens, if we each choose one small way that we can get involved, and it doesn't have to be with immigration, it can be with any other issue because all of these issues are related. But you have to choose an area where you can sort of find your point of entry and begin to chip away at these systems of oppression and invisibility, the systems that keep these dynamics out of our daily view. Is there any way for people to have contact with the children who've been separated from their parents to be able to come and read books to them, to to talk to them, to play with them, to bring them toys? Unfortunately, no. We do get that question a lot. There have been so many people, for example, um, about a year and a half ago, when there were all these news reports about um, the, you know, detention facilities and the kids' facilities not having enough toothpaste, for example, or toiletries, um, there were so many people who reached out because they wanted to donate. Unfortunately, no. Um, One of the the things is that they're kept very um, secure away from the public eye. Um, I think that is partly to protect them, but I think also partly to continue to to allow um, these dynamics to occur largely outside of of the view of the general public. So, no, there aren't opportunities to 
connect with children who are still separated from their families and in foster care. So in Rosie's journey, she was there for 81 days, you said? Yes. 81 days. At what point were you able to first contact her and tell her that um, that she had, had a light at the end of the tunnel and you were holding the lamp? So this is kind of a funny story, and she, she talks about it early on in the book. Um, that first mother for whom we posted bond came out of detention with this list of, of names. Um, Rosie had never contacted Jose Orochena, the attorney, um, even though his name and his number were circulating around the detention center, her cellmate had um, tried to urge her to contact him. And she said, well, why would I even contact him? Like, I don't have any money. Surely he's going to want money. You know, I have this $12,000 bond offer, but I don't have a way of getting $12,000. So, like, it's not even worth me contacting him. And um, nobody really knows how uh, he was contacted um, on her behalf. And in fact, when she goes out to see him in the visitation room, he's going through all of his paperwork and he says, oh, I, well, I don't have any paperwork for you. I don't know who you are. And she says, but you called me like they called me and said that I was supposed to come and visit you. So um, he actually is a person who when he saw her and he found out that she had a bond offer, he came back to me after his meeting with her and said, this is another mom. She does have a bond offer. Her two, her two children are in foster care in New York City do you have enough money to pay her bond? And we said yes. And so um, that was in July of 2018, and he flew with her to New York. Um, We thought it would be a while before she was reunified with the kids because that was typically um, the case. But it's about an hour after she landed. We were actually on our way to go get breakfast. We got a phone call from um, the foster care center saying that her kids were going to be released to her that day. Wow. And how do you think that happened? Um, there had been a lot of um, advocacy on the part of some local elected officials here in the city, um, particularly in my neighborhood, who had become very outspoken about family separation. they have been very supportive of our organization. Um, they actually went with us to the foster care center um, for the first mother whose kids were there, who were also reunited on the same day as Rosie and her kids. So I think their presence, Um, accompanying us to the center. It was also bringing some even more unwanted media attention, and I think that that helps speed things along. Ah, the infamous unwanted media attention. Right. (laughs) So, Julie, you co-authored the book, The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Story of Separation at the Border. How can people become more involved, or if they feel like they want to do something to help, where can they go and what can they do? Sure. So at the end of the book, both in English and in Spanish, um, there's a list of ways that people can get involved and some other resources, both online and reading, um, to learn more about immigration generally. Um, Also on our organization's website, which is immigrantfamiliestogether.com, you can find more resources and ways to get involved. And I would just add, you know, at, and in your intro, you were talking about all of these other um, issues that are happening right now that we're outraged about and need to be outraged about. And I would just say, you know, folks don't have to necessarily get involved directly with Immigrant Families Together or any immigrant advocacy organization for that matter. It's really about getting involved in issues in your community where you can make a difference because all of the issues that we care about, right, whether it's violence against black and brown people, whether it's educational and affordable housing access, health care access, these are all issues that ultimately affect immigrants and asylum seekers as well. So I think it's really important for folks to understand is that what the work that we're doing is work of building a better society, not just pushing back against toxic policies. And that work is long term, right? It's a long term commitment for all of us to get involved in the way that we can in our local communities. And of course, to vote. Ah, Yes. Dare to vote, huh? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> All right, Julie. Well, thank you so much for being with us, for uh, getting involved in starting this organization and for your continued work at reuniting these families together. The book is called The Book of Rosie, A Mother's Story of Separation at the Border. If you ever wondered what it's like and try to imagine reading this book will help you imagine the horror of having your children taken away from you with no idea where they're going or if you will ever see them again or how you will get through the next few days And this book gives you an incredible picture and insight into that. So, Julie, thank you for helping uh, Rosie write this. And again, The Book of Rosie is the book. Is there a website for the book? There is. It's bookofrosie.com. All right, Julie, we'll have a beautiful day. Continued success. And you got a home right here anytime you want to come back and talk. 
Thank you so much, Josefa. Have a beautiful day. You too. The power of ritual. What does it mean? And how can you turn your ordinary activities into an extraordinary ritual? It's all coming up next right here. Don't go away.